Hey, man, I think this laptop's broken. It's just a dollar sign, a blinking rectangle thingy. The mouse don't work either. Oh. The dollar sign, does that mean this is where I'm supposed to enter my salary? How many zeros are in a billion? I'll just put Jeff Bezos money. Don't know what that means. Hey, what's going on? I'm Will Button from DevOps for Developers. And today we're gonna to be taking like the five minute tour of Linux. So as a DevOps engineer, you have to have Linux skills. As a developer trying to add DevOps practices, you gotta have Linux skills. And it's a really, really deep subject that we're not gonna cover in this video, but I'm gonna show you enough so that you can get into a Linux system, work around on it, and it'll give you enough of a foundation that you can then start learning about other tasks that are possible in there and building your skill set from there. So let's jump into it. Right, so the first thing you're gonna notice here is our prompt, and this tells you a couple of things about the system. First of all, it tells you who you are logged in as, and I'm logged in as root, which you should never do, right? I'm logged in as root here because I'm actually running a Docker image on my workstation. But in reality, for your Linux servers, you never want to log in as root. You wanna log in as your own user and then use the permissions that are assigned to your user to do whatever task you need to do. All right, then we have the at symbol. And after the at symbol is the name of the server that we're logged into. Again, this is a Docker container, so it's just some random string of characters. If it were a full-blown Linux system, you would probably see like the host name, like, um, you know, billing server or web server or whatever it happens to be. The final thing I wanna point out here is this pound sign. And so the pound sign tells you that you are logged in or operating with root credentials. Now, if you're logged in as a regular user, that's going to be a dollar sign instead of a pound sign. So that's always a good indicator of where you are, where you are and what permissions you have while you're there. So let's just run through some basic commands here. The first one I want to show you is the ls command, which lists all of the files in the folder that you're currently in. If you're not sure which folder you're in, you can type pwd. That's print working directory is what it actually stands for. To go into one of the directories that you see there, we can type CD and the name of that directory. I can also type the first few letters and tab and get autocomplete as well. If I type LS and then dash ALH, that tells me the A says show all files, including hidden files. L says show them in the long format and H tells it to give me their respective file sizes in a human readable format. So if we go into the var directory and then do the long listing of files there, we see the first thing that we get is the permissions. Then we get the owner, the individual owner and the group that owns it, the file size, which this is just a directory, so it's 4K, the date created and the time created, and then finally the name. Let's go into our log directory here and there should be something interesting to look at. All right, here we see some actual files. And now the interesting thing is this part that I kind of skipped over earlier is the permissions. Uh, the, if it starts with a D, that means it's a directory. And then there's like three couplets or three sets of permissions here. This first set, the first three characters are the permissions for the owner, which is root in this case. The next three are the permissions for the group. And then the final three are the permissions for all users. And you'll see one of three things here. You'll see um, R for read, W for write, and X for execute. And then if those permissions don't exist, it's just a dash. So let's go home real quick and I'll show you something. I'll show you some tricks about managing file permissions. And I can go home by using the tilde shortcut. If we do pwd, I'm in root, which is my home folder. So I can use the touch command to create a file. And 
and it just creates an empty file. So you can see that it's zero bytes here and it inherits the default permissions of the folder that it's in. So I can use chmod change mod to change the permissions. And if I do 777 and then the name of that file, you can see that that gives everyone in the world read write access to that file. It also happens to turn it green in my particular terminal here. So file permissions 777 are something you never want to do. All right, just burn that into your brain. If you're giving file, if you're giving permissions to everyone in the world, you're making a big mistake. It's just opening it up where anyone can get to this file and you don't want to do that. But let's take a step back and figure out where that number seven came from. So I said that we had the read permission, the write permission, and then the execute bit, right? So here's the way that Linux treats those. Read, think of read as being worth four points and write as being worth two points and then execute being worth one point. So if I give read permissions plus write permissions plus execute permissions, that adds up to a total of seven. And I do that for each person or each set of permissions. So this is seven for the user who owns the file. This is seven for the group that owns the file. And this is seven for all users. So if I didn't want to do that, let's say that I wanted to give um, the owner read write permissions. I want to give the group that owns it read permissions and all users get no permissions. So let's run through that real quick. So we'll do our change mod and then our owner gets read and write permissions. So that's four plus two will be six. Our group will have um, read permissions. That's a four. And then we said everyone else gets no permissions. So that'll be a zero and we'll specify the name of the file. Do our ls command and now you can see that the permissions have been updated accordingly. You can remove files using the rm command. And there's another one if you want to remove a folder and all of its contents recursively use rm-rf but be careful doing that because it doesn't ask, it just does it. So if we were to do something like rm-rf forward slash, we would delete the entire contents of this entire server, which as you might guess, would be bad. If I wanna view the contents of the file, I can do cat and then the name of the file, and that will just display it out on the screen. Another one that comes up really handy for me is word count minus L, or word count, so we can do word count and that tells us how many words are in a file. I don't really use that a whole lot, but if we do a cat of the file and then pipe, so we use the pipe character, which allows us to take the output of one command and pipe that to the input of another command. So we'll do WC minus L. The minus L tells it I only wanna count the lines, and that tells me there's 141 lines in that file. Another way to view the file would be using the less command and that just puts it, oh, that's actually not installed, which is a great segue. So let's do this, let's clear the screen. Um, to install software, you use the yum command, yum install in the name of the package that you want. So now we have less installed. I wanna clear all this off the screen and I'm gonna use that with the control L shortcut, which just wipes the screen clean for you. And then we'll try that again, less Anaconda. And now that's gonna open our file up in a pager. So I can use the D key to move down through this file. I can use the U key to move up through it. And then I can use the uh, right arrow to go to the end, the left arrow to go back to the beginning, and then Q to quit, which lines up a lot with the commands that you'll use for a text editor called Vim. And I'm totally not gonna go into Vim in this video because that would be like, I don't know, an eight or 12 hour video. But eventually you're gonna have to learn Vim because you're gonna be going into these servers all the time. Sometimes you'll need to edit text files and Vim is the way to do it. All right, the last thing I wanna show you here 
One of the common things I do when I'm in a server is most of the time it's because it's not responding um, to like if it's a, an API server, it's not answering on whatever port it's listening on. So I need to see which ports it's listening on. The way to check to see which ports your server is listening on is with the netstat command and dash plnt flags, which I always just remember as plant without an A. And this particular one is not listening on any ports. But I can grab you this one and show it to you. And so what we see here is the local address, the colon, and then the port that it's listening on. So this one is listening on port 135, port 445, port 3389, and so on. And then the state is listening. And then it also shows you the process ID that's actually bound to that, which is cool because I didn't show you that. If we do PSAUX, you get a list of all the processes that are running and that process ID is found right here in this column. You also get to see the user who's running it and some other different stats about it. One other one that's cool to know is the top command. It shows you a list of all the running processes and shows you the amount of memory and CPU utilization that's going on. One thing that's really handy is in addition to CPU utilization, which you see on this row, is the load average, which you see highlighted right there because the load average sometimes is much, much more accurate of the amount of work that your computer or server is doing than the CPU utilization is. And there you have it, Linux in five minutes. So judging from the length of this video, math may not be my strong skill, but either way, hope that was helpful. Should be a good primer on you just to get you into a Linux system and help you like just get around in the system and then you know what questions to ask and you say, oh, I need to do this and you can just start building on that foundation. If nothing else, it's a cool party trick. You can use it to impress your friends. So good luck with that. If you liked the video, click the like button down below. Be sure and hit the subscribe button as well because I'm releasing new videos each week and I will see y'all next time.